All right, welcome to PowerShell Summit 2021. This is deploying and managing SQL Server with DBA tools. I'm Anthony Nocentino. I'm a consultant and trainer and founder of Centino Systems, where I specialize in system architecture and performance. There's my contact information there, so please feel free to reach out to me via email if you have any questions about today's session. I'm on Twitter pretty often. In fact, that's the primary way I interact with the community. So if you're not following me on Twitter, please do so. And I also blog pretty frequently at centinosystems.com slash blog. And I'm a Pluralsight author where I have a whole battery of courses on Linux, PowerShell, uh, SQL Server on Linux, and also Kubernetes containers and Azure stuff too. Lots of content. Feel free to reach out to me if you want access to that content for free, and I can give you a trial code to get up in there to learn all of those different things that are available on the Pluralsight platform. I'm a data platform MVP, and also wrote a book recently on Azure Arc enabled data services. So check that out. Now let's get into our agenda for today's session. And we're gonna kick that conversation off with a deployment challenge is really what's hard about deploying SQL Server and then doing it at scale. Once we understand what's hard about deploying SQL Server and doing it at scale, we'll look at some of the benefits of automation, basically why I wanna deploy and manage SQL Server in this way. Before we get into the meat of today's talk, where we focus on DBA tools and how we can use it to install and configure SQL Server, we're gonna look at some other automation solutions. And the reason why I wanna stop here is I wanna show you that there are other ways to basically do the same techniques that we're doing today with other tools that are available. Then we'll look at what we really are gonna focus on today, which is using DBA tools for automated deployment. At this point, we'll go through kind of the high level process on how we build the system and how we deploy SQL Server with it and configure SQL Server with DBA tools. But once we go through the high level process, then we'll get into some code and look at what's really going on behind the scenes when we use DBA tools to install SQL Server and also configure SQL Server. Once we have our SQL Server up, running and configured, we're gonna use Pester to make sure that, well, DBA tools did what I wanted it to do on our target SQL Server instances. And we'll use Pester to manage that process. We'll also use Pester to manage the configuration server of our SQL servers over time. So not only at deployment time, am I gonna make sure that my SQL server is configured in the appropriate way, but maybe a week later or a month later, I can come back and use this same tooling to make sure that my SQL server stayed in the state that I want it to be in. So let's start the conversation off with how many of you have a SQL server installation checklist, whether it's a spreadsheet, a Word document, whatever it is that describes the steps for you to install and configure a SQL server before you hand it off and put it into production. All right, many of us probably do, me included. In fact, I used to build SQL servers this way. I had a spreadsheet that had all of the steps that I had for installing and configuring SQL server. How many of you have logged into a SQL server in production and have found deviations from that standard, whether it be you forgot something from the spreadsheet, something got changed in a configuration, or someone else came along later and made a configuration change for you, right? This is a big challenge because we wanna make sure that the things that were deployed in production meet the standards for our organization. And so that kind of leads to some interesting things because I wanna be able to maintain control over an environment in a way that is gonna make sure that the systems that I have deployed are stable and configured properly. So I took to Twitter and I kind of asked a similar question in that I asked the community, well, in your environments, how many of you have automated SQL Server installations? And if so, what are you using? And so you can see here, I had about 115 votes and the distribution honestly was kind of surprising to me. 42.6% of the community or 42.6% of the participants in this poll have an automated solution, which frankly is a lot lower than I thought it was. And 57% of the sample here is still clicking next, next, next finish, which is a lot higher than I thought it was gonna be. And so, well, that means this talk is probably gonna be interesting to a lot of folks because we wanna to get to the point where we're automatically deploying SQL Server. And we'll talk about all the reasons why in today's session. Now, in this Twitter poll, I also asked, what are you using? So a lot of community leaders commented on what they're doing to deploy and to configure SQL Server in their environments. So I have a bit.ly link here, and I strongly encourage you to go check that out and see what the community is doing to install and configure SQL Server in their environments in an automated way. 
So when it comes to deploying SQL Server, what are some of the challenges that we face? And the number one thing for me is consistency, making sure that each SQL Server kind of has a base configuration that is gonna be the configure the best practice for an environment and being able to do that over and over again across all of the instances deployed. Now, of course, there will be configuration skew based on the particular requirements of an individual database system, but there are some core things that just need to be configured across all SQL Server instances and best practice configurations and things like that. And if I'm writing code to do that, then I can do that consistently every single time and not having forgot to set a particular best practice setting on an instance, right? I'm gonna have code that does this for me. Next up is speed of deployment. If I come along and I wanna deploy a SQL Server, I can pretty much as Anthony as an individual person can only do one at a time. If I try to do five at a time or 10 at a time, I can guarantee you it's gonna increase the error rate for me when it comes to managing and configuring those SQL servers that I'm trying to get out of the door. And so doing things in a GUI or doing things in a way that is not automated is going to restrict how fast I can roll out SQL servers when I need to or when they're requested. And then finally, configuration skew. We kind of touched on this already, but being able to make sure that everything is the same across all of our instances. And then also over time, how we change our environment, how we manage its configuration. And so we want to make sure that we have some way to control that skew. And we're going to talk about some solutions to that today in this session. And so some of the benefits of automation, this is the number one thing for me, repeatable, consistent processes for rolling out SQL Server in a defined best practice way for the standards for an organization and being able to do that over and over and over again. Being able to do that quickly, right? Since we will have code that describes how our SQL Server is configured, we can roll those SQL servers out a lot faster, whether it's one, 10 or a hundred in our environment, because we're going to have code that describes what we want. And in a scenario that we're going to talk about today, you're going to see that if I needed to deploy one SQL Server or 10 or a hundred, doing any code is going to be very, very fast. If I have to log into a GUI and do that, it's just, it's just not possible to roll those things out that quickly. The solution that we're using today, I've actually built and deployed in multiple customer sites. And we'll talk about the, uh, let's say they'll talk about the uh, target for the solution and why I'm using this versus a grander configuration management system when we get to that portion of the talk. But this solution, I have customers that are deploying SQL servers from request to functioning production ready SQL server in less than 10 minutes, right? in a defined best practice configuration way. And that is a fantastic thing to do when you are in charge of rolling out those types of systems, because now you're not bottlenecked by rolling out instances of SQL Server, and you can go focus on other more high value tasks in your organization. The next benefit of automation that I like is infrastructure as code. I will now have a document that describes how my SQL Server is configured, and I could take that and park that in source control and manage that over time. Next up is reduces human error, right? Back to that spreadsheet idea that we started off with. If I have to go through and make sure everything in that checklist is checked off, eh, I'm gonna miss something. I'm human, it's just a fact of life. I do also like to point out though that it can automation can increase human error. So for example, if I need to roll out 30 SQL Servers and I configure them all wrong, well, I do need to take that into account when I'm designing my automation solution to make sure that, well, I don't break things at scale. And we touched on this concept already, but really scale out installations, whether it's one SQL Server 10, or if your infrastructure can support it, 100 SQL Servers, we can deploy those concurrently at scale and really provide a lot of value to our orgs when it comes to rolling things out quickly. Some of the lesser known benefits of automation is this, measuring configuration skew. If I push out a SQL Server configuration, I push that thing into production, and I come back later, and I measure its configuration with a tool and see that it's changed, well, there you go. I can understand what's changed in my environment and potentially go fix that or talk to the person that made that change or investigate why that change is made. This one is a big one for me, high availability. You're like, huh? Why, how is high availability and automation connected? Because I can do things fast and consistently, which means things like restores can be simpler and automated with much simpler code because, well, everything is the same. If I have to pick up a database from instance A and drop it down on down onto instance B, I don't have to write a purpose-built restore script for that because, well, that's gonna be simpler because things like 
the disk topology will be the same. Super valuable concept there. Similarly, if I can roll out a SQL server and deploy all of the databases within the recovery objectives of my organization using automation, well, I don't have to involve more complicated technologies like availability groups and failover clusters to meet recovery objectives. I can confidently go back to the business and say, it takes me 10 minutes to roll out a SQL server, an hour to restore all the databases. I can meet your recovery objective with just scripting, right? And that is a huge, huge thing that people overlook when they're building high availability systems and recovery objectives. Everybody jumps to these really advanced technologies that can be challenging to manage. This is a, an extremely valid technique for that. And then next up is troubleshooting. Again, if all of the systems are the same, well, it's pretty easy to figure out like, well, something's changed. It's not right here. It's not built to the standard. And you can figure that out. Moreover, if all of the systems are the same, I'm able to do things like database restores and get those things back online quickly and efficiently because of how my environment is configured in a consistent way. All right, so with the benefits of automation behind us, let's look at some of the possible solutions for automating the installations of SQL Server. And first up is configuration.ini. Since SQL Server 2005, there has been an automated way to install SQL Server as part of the command line experience with the SQL Server Installation Manager. That's configuration.ini. You can go through and you can specify all the configuration parameters that you need for your install and base configuration of SQL Server. But the scope of this installation is limited to just that, installation and basic configuration tasks. There's other things that go into the best practice installation and configuration of a SQL Server. There's things that change on the Windows host, but there's other things outside of the scope of configuration.ini that are need to change inside of the SQL Server instance. And so while it's a good solution for automating the installation of SQL Server, not a good solution for kind of the overall arching configuration things that I want to maintain when I deploy and configure a SQL Server. Next up is a PowerShell DSC or desired state configuration. In fact, this was the first solution that I chose for my customers when it came to installing and configuring SQL Server because it kind of gave me that full scope configuration element that I wanted. But in my customer sites, I generally need a point solution of install SQL Server, configure SQL or configure SQL Server and move on. And PowerShell DSC doesn't quite give me that because there's really in an organization, it raises the tech barrier. And so I need to make sure that if you want to use DSC, that your org kind of buys into those configuration manager concepts. And honestly, like a lot of customer sites that I work with aren't quite there yet. And so I need something that's imperative that just says install SQL Server, configure SQL Server. DSC is a perfectly valid way to install and manage your environments over time if the org is bought into those concepts. And at PowerShell Summit this year, Jess Ponfret is going to deliver a session on this. And if you're interested in comparing and contrasting uh, the different methods to deploy SQL Server, I strongly encourage you to check out her session. Next up is things like Chef, Puppet, Ansible, Chocolatey. If you're using any one of these technologies in your organization today, chances are you can go ahead and install and manage the configuration of your SQL Server. In fact, I encourage you to look at these techs and see if they can help you solve these problems. The processes that we're going to describe today in this session will certainly apply conceptually to each one of these automation tools. Basically, install a SQL Server, configure a SQL Server. And so check those out if your org is already using those. Next is containers and Kubernetes. In fact, I talk about this all the time, right? Deploying SQL Server in containers, deploying SQL Server in Kubernetes, but that's all SQL Server on Linux. True fact is most of my customer base is still on Windows and has Windows-based SQL servers. And so I need a way from a pinpoint solution standpoint to come into an org and install a Windows-based SQL server in DBA tools, it gives me that. And you might be asking, well, why didn't you choose the DBA tools initially back in 2017 when I kind of started this automation project for my customers? Well, DBA tools at the time didn't have an installation command line. In fact, I don't think it came along until 2019. And then in 2019, I took my DSC implementation and replatformed it completely using imperative uh, techniques using DBA tools. And now I use that at all of my customer sites. And again, the idea here is I need a pinpoint solution for an org to install and configure SQL Server in an automated way. If my company or if the organizations that I'm working with have things like DSC or Chef or Puppet or Ansible, I'm gonna bolt onto those technologies because those have already been adopted by the organiz organization. 
If they don't have anything though, DBA tools is the solution for me. So that brings us to the next part of our talk, using DBA tools for automated deployments of SQL Server. And so if you're not familiar with deep, what DBA tools is, let's start there. DBA tools is a community driven PowerShell module that has the goal of managing, configuring, and deploying SQL Server. In fact, if you go to the project site, it's actually defined as a goal that DBA tools effectively is command line SQL Server Management Studio. So anything that you find in SSMS should be available as a commandlet inside of the DBA tools module. And I love the fact that that's their project scope because then that means we can literally do whatever we want at the command line using SSMS. In fact, it's my go-to tool now, even before cracking open SSMS. If I'm gonna do something inside of SQL Server and I need to potentially do that at scale, DBA tools is the way to go for me. When it comes to getting DBA tools, we can get it in a whole collection of ways. And first up is the PowerShell gallery. You can go on to GitHub and actually download the code itself at this link here. In fact, I strongly encourage you to go to the GitHub repo and just check out what's going on in there. It's a very vibrant community, lots of things happening and issues. And so just go ahead and check out and see how people are using DBA tools. And then also the code. If you need to know how something is implemented, it's there on GitHub for you to review. Another way to get DBA tools is Chocolaty, and then finally, an offline installation. And I have a link here with um, the steps to go do that. And in some organizations, your data centers don't have direct internet access. And so this is the technique that you can use to get DBA tools onto those servers. Now, next is gonna be, what's the core functionality of DBA tools? Well, I just kind of alluded to that with the fact that it's basically command line SMS. In fact, if you go, on to dbatools.io, the website, you'll find this grouping of all of the different things or categories of commandlets that are available to configure and manage your SQL Server. These are the categories of commandlets. And then from here, you can drill down and go even further to the commandlets that are available. And we're not gonna go through each and every one of these, but the idea here is to see this huge list and think, well, I can literally configure anything I want in my SQL Server. And that's a fantastic piece of functionality. And we get later on into the session and you're building more sophisticated or we're building more sophisticated installation techniques and configuration techniques. This is our toolkit, right? These are the things that we can do. So whether it's configuring things like network configurations and TLS certificates or TempDB config, this is the bucket of stuff that we can grab from to make those configurations. So within all of that functionality that's available inside of DBA tools, we're gonna to focus on one commandlet in this portion of the talk, that is install DBA instance. Install DBA instance is the commandlet that we can use to install SQL Server. And it really only needs one thing, access to the installation source files or the media to install a SQL Server. And so that's gonna be the focus of this talk and also how we deploy our SQL Server. In the second part of the talk, we'll look at other commandlets for how we can configure our SQL Server. And so with that, let's move on to the solution architecture, or really how I deploy this solution at customer sites. Now keep in mind, this is a point solution that I'm gonna to use to install and configure SQL Server at customer sites, kind of keeping the tech bar kind of as low as possible so it's a supportable and maintainable solution in some organizations. So the first thing that I need is an admin desktop, basically a jump box for me to log into and install all the tooling that's required for the solution. So things like I need PowerShell, I need DBA tools module installed, some other modules we'll talk about a little bit later that I'm using for some configuration. Things like VS Code are all gonna be on this admin desktop. And this is gonna be the thing that I RDP into to drive the installation. The next thing that I need is what I call the deploy server, which is basically just a file server. And on that deploy server or file server are two things, the installation sources or the installation media for SQL Server and also update sources. Update sources are just gonna be things like cumulative updates and service packs. And if you didn't know, what we can do when we install SQL Server, we can combine the installer with a cumulative update and slipstream the update into the installation in one shot. And so bringing those together, I can do something like deploy SQL Server 2019, CU5 or eight or whatever it is on that initial installation rather than having to install the RTM release and then come back later with a second process to patch. We can get this all done in one shot. The next part of the solution is gonna be the actual target server or servers that I want to install SQL Server onto. And so that 
will be in our data center there. Now, the deploy server and the target instance, the thing that we want to deploy SQL Server onto, should likely be in the same data center or have really high speed connectivity between the two because the installation process is pretty heavy in its size and also the number of files that need to be transferred. So try to make sure that the deploy server and the target server are physically adjacent. So from a process standpoint, what I'm gonna do is execute some PowerShell on the admin desktop, which is then gonna target, well, the target instance that I wanna install SQL Server onto. The install DBA instance commandlet is gonna kick off a SQL Server installation process. So that's gonna start up and it's gonna read the installation files and the update sources from the deploy server and drive that installation process. So now that we know the high level architecture of the solution, let's look at the solution workflow and the actual steps that we're gonna to execute to install and configure our SQL Server. And we're gonna start off with a virtual machine template. And we're gonna focus on VMware today, but these ideas and concepts can be applied to any underlying virtualization technology. And so in the VM template is where we're gonna put very static configurations, things that are never gonna change. So things like our drive topology or configuration settings for our swap, et cetera, are all gonna be baked into the VM template. And we're gonna go through some other best practice configurations momentarily when we dive into this in a little more detail and what we need to have baked into the template for SQL Server. Then once we have our VM template built, we go ahead and instantiate a collection of virtual machines that we want to deploy SQL Server onto. And so once we have those machines up and running and ready, we want to execute a series of pre-flight checks against those. And what pre-flight checks are, are checks that I want to perform on the VM that I have to help me guarantee the success of the installation of SQL Server that's gonna be coming in a few seconds. So making sure that the drive topology is correct, that our virtual machine can actually access the installation media. We'll have a series of checks that help guarantee the success of the installation of SQL Server. The next part of our workflow is gonna be the actual installation of SQL Server, where we'll execute the install DBA instance commandlet to target that installation onto the number or onto the SQL servers that we wanna deploy. Once we have our SQL server up, running and ready, we'll execute a series of configuration scripts that will deploy or that will configure our SQL server for us. And really what these are is just a series of DBA tools, commandlets that drive the configuration into the desired state that we want for the SQL servers that we're deploying. Once our SQL server is up, running and configured, we'll then execute a series of post-flight checks to make sure that everything that we did to that SQL server actually got done to that SQL server testing and making sure that our system is in the defined desired state. So let's dig into each one of those workflow steps. We're gonna start off with virtual machine template. This is where we're gonna bake in very static configuration best practices, basically things that are never ever gonna change. In addition to OS level configuration, we can also implement best practice configurations for the virtual machine configurations. And like I said, we're gonna focus on VMware today, but really these techniques apply to any hypervisor. And so if you are using VMware, you're gonna do things like disable vCPU hop log or making sure you're using the right para-virtualized storage and network adapters for your configuration and also the right number of storage adapters for your virtual machines. We're also gonna define a standard drive topology for things like the number of volumes and the number of folders that we wanna to have to help have standardized layouts for things like where our databases live and where our transaction logs live and system databases and really have that be standard across all of the virtual machines that we create because this is gonna to lead to simpler restore operations. Trust me, this is a life that I would love to have learned or lesson that I would love to have learned many, many years ago. Now you might be thinking, well, what if I need more advanced disk configurations and more disks? Well, then build that into the template, right? Or if you need to have multiple volumes to support a database, you can use volume mounts within a directory. So that's how you can scale that out there. You might also be thinking, well, how do I size the virtual machine template? Do I wanna allocate like all the storage I need for every database in my environment? No, what I do for this is each one of the disks that I attach to the VM template is just 10 gigs, I'll define I'll format the file system and I'll define the drive layout at 10 gigs. And then when I create a VM from that template, I'll then scale the disks to the appropriate size for the virtual machine that's being deployed. 
Uh, so next up is, yeah, defining NTFS allocation units using the best practice there. 64 KB, bake that into the VM template and never ever think about it again. Other base OS configuration practices include things like the swap configuration. You wanna have a static swap file uh, or statically sized swap file for SQL Server and things like uh, high performance power mode and volume, it's all stuff that you would normally do just and never ever think about again and bake into that virtual machine template. When it comes to kind of the exhaustive list of things that you should think about when it comes to deploying VMware on SQL Server, like the actual best practices guide, well, here's the link to that guide. And so we just kind of went over the big high level or big ticket items here. Check out this guide here to dive into what you need to know about deploying SQL Server on VMware and think about what you need to put into the template that becomes part of that static configuration. And so now that we have a virtual machine template built, and let's say we've instantiated some virtual machines from that template, it's time to look at pre-flight checks or basically how we can help guarantee the success of the installation of SQL Server that we're about to do. And so we're gonna run some checks to make sure that certain elements or requirements are met. And first up is accessibility of WinRM for PowerShell remoting. I wanna make sure that the system that I'm driving the installation from can actually open a PowerShell remoting connection to the instance that I want to install SQL Server to. Next is, or next up in our pre-flight checks list is service accounts. The service accounts I want to run SQL Server as, are they valid accounts in the domain and can I authenticate with them? I want to basically test, are those service accounts, well, functioning, working accounts? And if they are, yes. And that helps guarantee the success of my installation. Similarly, an installation account, this is the account that will actually start the installation process on the target instance. Do I have the right credentials for that? I wanna make sure that that's the case before I attempt an installation. The next pre-flight check that we have is to test the disk topology. Are the expected volumes actually there and configured on the soon to be target install of SQL Server? We wanna make sure that that target server can actually talk to the installation share. Can it actually access it over the network? And then can that target server also access the update share, right? For the, with the update sources so that we could slipstream the patches into the base installation. So once we pass all of these things, then we help guarantee the success of the installation that we're about to do. Now you might be thinking, how do I implement these checks? Well, what I use is Pester, right? And chances are most folks here know what Pester is, but if you don't, Pester is a testing framework. It allows me to write code and inspect the result and then measure if, is that a pass or a fail, right? Is a testing framework. And so we're gonna use Pester to help us validate both our pre-installation checks and also our post-installation or our post-configuration tasks. And so it's a very valuable tool because I can write a collection of tasks and quickly scan the results and move forward to the next part of the installation if things have passed. And if not, well, then I go correct that and before I attempt the installation. And so a very valuable tool to do that. In addition to our pre-flight checks, we can also use it for our post-flight checks to make sure that everything is actually in the desired state that we expect it to be in when our installation and the configuration is finished. Now, maybe a week or two later or a month later, I come back, I can use that same test to measure configuration skew, right? I handed off that server to someone and I made sure it was in a desired state with Pester and it was. And then I can come back a week later, a month later, I'd use that same test to measure what's changed. And then once something's changed, I can go investigate why. Maybe there's a valid reason why it's changed. Someone might have made a setting in reaction to maybe a production instance, but maybe they didn't. Maybe they just changed it into troubleshooting and forgot to set it back, right? That helps me control that skew over time. We could also use Pester to assert the desired state, meaning if I'm not getting the values that I want or things have skewed from the desired state, I can actually write code to go ahead and make those changes again. But if you get into this point, you probably need a configuration management tool to help you solve that problem. This might not be the best solution for you, but it's possible to do that here. Now, what about something like DBA checks? Well, DBA checks is more of an enterprise class uh, way to manage the best practices configuration and also operations of a SQL Server environment. And I strongly encourage you to check it out because it might help you do a lot of these things that I'm doing in the pre-flight checks. You might be thinking, well, why are you bringing up DBA checks now? Because remember, the target for this solution is, is very pinpoint and very focused. I want to install and configure SQL Server. 
And I don't want to bring a lot of new technology into the picture, have to install things and set up like Power BI servers and things like that, which DBHX needs. And that's fine. It's a fantastic tool, but I'm trying to keep the barrier to entry for the solution as low as possible so that it has the least friction. But if you are an enterprise DBA and you need a system that maintains configuration over time, check out DBHX. It can definitely help you out there. And so let's look at the implementation of a couple of pre-flight checks using Pester. And so we'll go through some of the code together here. And so in a, or in a Pester test, you'll define a context. So basically a collection of tests, right? In this case here, I wanna make sure that the server is accessible via WinRM. And so inside that first bracket there, curly brace, I'll have the actual commandlet that is the test. And so here you can see I'm using test net connection. What test net connection is gonna do is test access to a TCP port. In this case, it's gonna be WinRM. I'm using the information level quiet so that it returns a Boolean value and that result will be stored in the variable there result. Then the next part of the test is gonna inspect the result. And so here I have some text that describes what I want. And so it says it, well, the target server should be accessible via WinRM. And then we're gonna inspect the result. So here we see result pipe should with the parameter be true. It's gonna make sure that the value that is in the result variable is true. And I have a because clause here to print out a string that says, well, because we need to do stuff with WinRM during the installation. Close that uh, with the curly brace, another curly brace, and there is your first pester test. Now the values can be other values other than Booleans, but this example here is a Boolean. We can have discrete values, we can have ranges and things like that the, for each of the types of tests. But here we see it is the result of a Boolean. Uh, another test that I have is to make sure that the service account is valid. And so what we have here is I'm calling a custom function that I wrote that will test an AD credential. And so it's gonna pass in a credential and then that will also return a Boolean value that's stored in the variable credential test result. Then we have it, well, it's testing to see if the engine service account is valid and then it outputs the engine service account when the script runs. So inside of that, we'll test the result. So there we see credential test result pipe should be true again because we should uh, need SQL Server have to has or has to have a valid service account. Close that brace or bracket, or curly brace, and then close that other curly brace. And there is our second pester test. And inside of our pre-flight checks is I have a collection of these that will go through and test all the various elements that I need to help guarantee the success of the installation of SQL Server that we're about to do. And so to look at that output, we then, or to run that script and look at some of the output, here is what you'll see when you run this pester test. So there we see it describing pre-flight installation checks. There we see context server accessible via WinRM. The target server should be accessible via WinRM. And so that's the test and the result. Green is good, means it passed the result. If it failed, it'll be red and it'll output an error message describing the failure. And so there we can see some other tests for our service account validation, installation account validation, and then also at the bottom there, testing for the existence of the required drives on a target. And so there it's looking for each of the drives that are defined or that I want to have defined on the target instance and green means that those were found. All right, so with our virtual machine up and running and having passed our pre-flight checks, it's time to install SQL Server with install DBA instance. And so we're gonna use a uh, PowerShell splatting to kind of just make our code a little more readable because there is a lot going on in the parameters that I use to install SQL Server. Now, the ones that we're looking at here are the ones that I use as a base, right? You can get by with a lot, or you can get by with other configurations and a lot smaller configurations based on what you need. But this is what I use for most SQL Server installations that I perform. And so with all of those installation parameters loaded up into that hash table, we'll pass those into the install DBA instance command like this. And this gives our, just makes our code a lot more readable. And so let's walk through some of the key installation parameters that I use when it comes to deploying SQL Server using DBA tools. And first up is this bucket of parameters here. We start off with, well, SQL instance. That's gonna be the target instance that we wanna install SQL Server to. Next up is the path of the installation sources. So we set the parameter path equal to this variable installation sources that's indexing an array based on the version. And what I'm doing here is 
giving my installer the ability to pick various versions of SQL Server on our deploy server. And I'll show you the code for that when we get into the demos, but this is an easy way to make it so that the script can point at a 2012 installer or 14, 16, 19, whatever it is I need in my environment. I also need to tell the install DVA instance which version of SQL Server I'm installing. So there I'm using that same version variable for the version parameter. And so that's kind of all flattened out there from a configuration standpoint. And like I said, we'll see how I'm using the installation sources when we get into the source code in the upcoming demonstration. If I want any features, I'm gonna define them here. And so by default, I'm just gonna use the engine, but I'll show you where that's being set in the demo code. And then in the next bucket of items, I'm gonna be defining the paths that I want SQL Server installed to. And then also for the various data elements of SQL Server. So there we see install path or instance path. That's gonna be where SQL Server is installed. Then I have my data path, which is where the databases are gonna be, log path, tempdb, and backup path. And so based on the drive topology that I've defined, these values will be set. And again, when we get into the demos, I'll show you how I'm setting those variables. Next up is a collection of credentials. So there is the admin account, engine credential, agent credential, and credential. Let's walk through each one of those. Admin account gives you the ability to put a user or a group automatically into the sysadmin fixed server role at install time. And so if you have to add maybe like the database administrators group from your Active Directory domain into the local sysadmin group, you can do that here. There we also see the engine credential and agent credential. Sometimes service accounts or managed service accounts are used here and are defined. And so we'll pass those credentials in at the command line here for both the engine and also the SQL Server agent. So again, this is my default config for the database engine. If you're doing more advanced configurations with other features, you can add them here. There's parameters exposed for those. Then we have credential, which is gonna be the credential that the actual installation runs as on the target instance. Now this configuration parameter here is pretty unique. Anything that's not exposed as a PowerShell commandlet or the install DBA instance commandlet parameter is still configurable. And so anything that's exposed by SQL Server as an install parameter uh, for SQL Server's installation can be added here. And we'll talk about the implementation details of this in a moment, but this is a really elegant way to add in kind of the, the dustier corners of SQL Server configuration into the install DBA instance commandlet without having you know hundreds of potential parameters for some more advanced or es and esoteric configurations. And I do have a couple of examples of this in our upcoming demo code. We have perform volume maintenance tasks, which allows the SQL Server uh, engine account the ability to do instant file initialization. And most often that's gonna be set to true, depending on a security profile of your organization, or organization you might not want that. But most SQL Server installs do have that enabled for instant file initialization. And then finally, we have a collection of parameters to say restart equals true. So if we do have a reboot required when the SQL Server installation is finished, it'll go ahead and do that. Confirm equals false. Uh, by default, there's a yes, no prompt in install DBA instance. This will bypass that. And I love looking at output. So I set verbose equals true, or at least for the demos and debugging, I'll set that to true. So we can kind of see the process going along. And so this is kind of the core of what we want to do. And when we get into the upcoming demos, I'm going to show you how I bring lots of different data points together to make this very easily, easily used and a reusable piece of code. All right, so let's do it. After that code walkthrough, let's look at some pre-flight checks and then actually install SQL Server with install DBA instance. All right, so let's walk through this code together. And here we are in VS Code. I'm gonna make all of this code available for you to download, but if you go take this solution, implement this yourself. I wanna walk you through the big picture, high level ideas in the code, but trust me, don't run this code in production. Not that it's bad code, but I want you to build this type of solution using your own tools and techniques for your environment. But this is the actual code that I use at customer sites. And so let's begin the process of walking through this code together. We're gonna to start off with how I load up the solution and its configuration. We'll walk through how I do the security and credentialing, then the actual pre-flight checks and the install DBA instance commandlets usage. And so let's check it out. 
The first bucket of code here is gonna load up some environment settings. So on line three there, we see environment equals lab. And what I'm gonna use that for is as a key to load different settings that are specific to each environment. And so what we're gonna do is set environment equal to lab, and then inside the function import environment settings, here you can see I'm using some code to load different environment settings. And so line eight there, you can see I'm loading up import DC one environment settings, or on line 10, I have a block there that's gonna conditionally load up the environment settings for my lab. And that's gonna import what's defined in the PowerShell script import lab environment settings. And so let's go ahead and walk through that bunch of code together. And so inside here, I have the code that is specific to an environment, right? So you saw DC one for data center one, you saw lab for my lab environment. And so what's specified in here is the more static configurations that are environment specific. And so if I need to switch this for a different customer site or for a different environment, I can have different environment settings files to define that. And so here we see things like active directory domain being defined or the drive path configuration. So there we see instance path, data path, log path, and so on. And then the values that I wanna have those set to for this specific environment. Moving forward, we also see where we're gonna get our installation sources and update sources from it. So let's walk through this code together. We define an install root, which is the actual file share on our deploy server. That's, that's all that deploy server is, is a file server. Then for installation sources, I'm using a hash table to have a key for the different versions of SQL Server. And then the value is the actual network location on the install route or the deploy server where those files actually exist. And so we see 2012, 2014, and so on. And then the full paths to each one of those installation sources. And so that's how I'm able to dynamically select where the media comes from based on the version parameter that's specified. And I'll show you where I set that here in a few minutes in the main script. And we also set the update sources as well. So we'll take all of that, load that up and run that code. And that's gonna load our environment settings. And then on line four, it's also gonna load up a function to test an AD credential. And then later on, we're gonna use invoke SQL configure to configure our SQL instance, but I'm setting and loading all those functions and variables now. So that's loaded up and we can move on to the more dynamic parts of our install. And so in the next bucket of code on lines nine, 10 and 11, we're gonna define that version variable. And so in this case here, it's gonna be 2019. We'll define the actual name of the SQL instance. In this case, it's gonna be DBA SQL one. So that's the target install or the target instance that we wanna install SQL Server to. And then I'm also loading up an array of the actual features that we wanna install. In this case, I'm just using engine. Where'd I get that string from? Well, that's gonna be from the command line install parameters for SQL Server. And so engine, SSAS, SSRS, et cetera, can be added here. Those values, you can either look at the install documentation for install DBA instance or the SQL Server docs. Now moving forward into the next bucket of code, we're gonna load up some credentials for the service account that we're gonna run SQL Server as on the engine, and then also the installation credential. And so we're gonna go ahead and run all that code here and create those objects, which are gonna be of type PS credential, which is required by the install DBA instance commandlet. So two credentials getting set there, one for the service account for the engine credential, and then one for me for the installation credential. And so you can see I'm using get credential here to on line 17, to at the command prompt at the bottom, allow me at runtime to specify the credential that I want to install SQL Server as. So this is what's driving the installation on a target instance. And so I'm gonna type my password in here at the bottom. And then when I go and I launch the installer, it's actually gonna use that credential to run the installation. The next bucket of code we have here is the actual preflight checks. And so we're gonna call this test preinstallation checks.ps1 file which is gonna define our pester test. On line 21, we're calling invoke pester, calling that script with a collection of parameters for the things that we need to test. So SQL instance, engine credential, et cetera. We're also specifying the pass-through parameter so that the result value is stored in 
the variable preflight check result, which will inspect there on line 33 to see if there were any failures. And so we can quickly investigate at the command line or with um, any automations if there was a failure inside of the pester script that we run. And so if we look inside of the pester script, here we have, or the pester test, here we have some of the tests that we looked at in the presentation. So there we see our, we see describe pre-installation checks. We see SQL server, or we see context is server accessible via WinRM, and then the test that we wanna execute. And then we have a collection of tests performing various functions, testing WinRM, our service account validation. Then we also see our, yeah, so results should be true because we want to do stuff with WinRM. Going down a little bit further, we can see installation account validation to test that credential. And there we see the usage of that test AD credential function, which will be available in the downloads with the uh, from the conference on line 32. Now on line 38, I have a little bit more of a complex test described there. I'm using a loop to iterate through the very or iterate through the drives that we received from uh, get PS drive that was executed against the target instance. And so you can see we can still use PowerShell constructs here to drive our tests and keep our code a little more tight if we need it to be. And so for each one of those tests, it'll go and check to make sure that the drive is there. And if it fails, we'll get that as output on our console and also as the result of our pester test. And we can inspect that if needed. So that's our pester test there. Let's go ahead and take that code. Highlight all, highlight all of that and execute that code to execute the pester test. And at the bottom here, hopefully we just see a whole bunch of things that are green. Now I do wanna call out that this script can be run in its entirety, but I'm walking through it section by section here with you so you can see kind of the big picture items of the process that we're using. All right, so there at the bottom, we see 12, te uh, 12 tests have passed and it was completed in seven seconds. There are no failed or skipped tests, so everything is looking good there. So moving forward into the next phase, we're gonna use install DBA instance to install our SQL server. And so on line 39 there, you see I'm loading up a hash table that defines a configuration. And so these are those more advanced configuration parameters that aren't exposed as parameters of the commandlet. And so two examples here are update source and then browser service startup type. Where did I get those values from for the hash table? Those came from the actual SQL Server configure or SQL Server uh, command line installation document. That document describes all of the different parameters that you can use to install a SQL Server with. Install DBA instance doesn't implement parameters for every single one. And so you can grab the string from that install document or the installation documentation and pop it in here. And that's what I did for update sources and also browser service startup type. I then set those values to the values that I want them to be. So update sources being the location of our patches. And then I have a discrete value of automatic for browser service startup type. Moving forward, let's go ahead and look at our installation parameters. Since they're on line 54, you see I'm setting the configuration parameter to the value of the variable, the configuration that we just set. We walked through all of these configuration parameters in the presentation. So we'll go ahead and start the process off here of installing on line 61. I have install DBA instance. I'm then also taking the result of install DBA instance and storing that in a variable name installation result, which we can inspect later for success or failure. So we'll go ahead and highlight all of this code and run that code. And so there on line 64, you see I'm inspecting the output of our installation result. If it's not successful, then I'm gonna write out an error message. And then also the uh, location of the log file on the target instance. And so if something does go wrong, well, you can look at the output here in the verbose output, or you can go to the target instance and read that installation log file. And so from a troubleshooting standpoint, that just goes back to regular SQL Server installation failure troubleshooting. You read the log file, figure out whatever went wrong and is blocking the installation and correct it and then rerun this part of the script to make, help make that or to complete that installation.
So the install at this point in time is up and running against the target instance, but there's no output on the console and the PowerShell console to tell you that, well, is it running or not? And so for the impatient folks out there like me, I'm going to go ahead and log into the console of the server to show you what to look for on the target instance. So there we see scenario engine.exe running on the target instance, which in this case is the virtual machine that we wanted to install to. We also see the username is our installation account. So that's the install credential that we built up together and used to install our instance with. Now the installation has completed. And in the bottom here, we can see that the installation we have successful is true at restarted equals false. And we also have the location of the log file for the installation summary. So yeah, there we see successful true and the log file. So if you want to go look at the detailed steps that occurred on the target instance, you can inspect that. Now on our VM again, I want to bring back up to show you that our processes are up and running. So there we see SQL Server agent running. And if we scroll down a little bit, let's look for SQL Server.exe. In the list there, we see SQL Server.exe. So we know SQL Server and the SQL Server agent are up and running on a target instance and our installation was successful. But we also do that because of the result of the output, but I just wanted to show you some additional places that you can look. All right, so now that we have our SQL Server installed, it's time to configure our SQL Server. And so we're gonna talk about a script that I use called Invoke SQL Configure. And what Invoke SQL Configure is, is a custom function. And the idea here is we're gonna perform the post installation configuration tasks on our instance. So it's not a DBA tools commandlet per se, but a really a collection of DBA tools commandlets that I'm gonna to use to perform the post installation configuration tasks that I want on the instance, bringing my system into the desired state. Now I'm using kind of a concept from DSC in this script in that it's item potent, meaning I can run this script on an instance and it'll configure all of those settings, but then I can come along again later and run that script again, and it's not gonna change anything if those values are already set. And so it really, it's a collection of test and set functions inside of that script to drive the system towards a de desired state based on the DBA tools commandlets that I'm using. And so inside of invoke SQL configure, we're gonna have that code that defines what we want done. So here we can see, I'm gonna have a script named invoke SQL configure, which will take a parameter of a SQL instance name. And then inside of there, I'll have a collection of functions that I've defined. And then at the bottom of that script, we'll call those functions to execute that code. And so here we have a function defined Disay or disable SA login, and it's going to disable the SA login on the instance because that's part of the standard configuration that I want for an instance. And so here, in the beginning, the parameters I have a required parameter of a SQL instance name, and then a parameter with a pre-populated value of MSSQL server for the instance name. And so, if we don't define an instance name, it'll populate that, or we can add in a named instance if we are using named instances in our environment. And so to disable the SA login, I'm gonna use the DBA tools commandlet because, well, I'd like to reuse code that's maintained by other people because then I don't have to maintain that code, but kind of jokingly, but we wanna we want embrace the community standards here, in this case being a DBA tools commandlet. So get DBA login, uh, defining a instance there, so SQL instance, and then appending on the instance name, and then where the object has the name equal to SA, we're gonna pipe that into set DBA login disable. And so this commandlet here doesn't quite have an implementation to test and set because set DBA login does that for me. If I pass that uh, SA object or SA login all the way through the set DBA login that's already disabled, it's just gonna print the warning and move on. And so we have that built in to set DBA login for us. And so inside of invoke SQL configure, you'll see this, um, You'll see this pattern repeat it over and over again for all of the different configuration elements for the instance. So things like trace flags, tempdb config, all of the stuff that I'll configure in an instance is gonna be configured inside of invoke SQL configure. And so let's go ahead and do that together and look at how we can use DBA tools to configure a SQL Server instance. All right, so back in our code, let's open up the invoke SQL configure file. Now invoke SQL configure is just a collection of function definitions first, and then at the bottom, we'll call those function definitions to configure the instance. And so the first function that we have defined is configure page file, which is going to configure the page file based on the settings that I've defined. 
In this case, setting the page file location to the F drive with a fixed size of eight gigabytes, because that's what I want to use for this particular environment. You can change this to the likings for your environment if needed. Moving forward, we have another function here, add SQL management to local admin. And what this function will do is add a group to a local group on the instance. So basically I'm taking the DBA group and adding it to the local administrators group on a target instance. Moving forward in the functions or the function listings, we see disable SA login, which is the one that we walked through in the presentation. And there's the code to do just that, to disable the SA login with set DBA login. Next up in the bucket of code that we have here is configure trace flag. So depending on the configuration of our instance or depending on the version of our instance, configuring the appropriate trace flags. The next bucket of code that we have here is to, let's bring this back in the view, scroll back a little bit, set SP configure options. So things like remote admin connections, optimize for ad hoc workloads. Again, anything that I can set on the instance, I'm gonna do in this install configure script. There's configure our database mail and so on. So we're doing lots of normal DBA tasks, but all in our invoke SQL configure script. Now at the bottom here, after the function definitions, we do call this, the functions that are defined inside of this script. And so there we see things like set DBA power plan, set DBA max stop. These are just straight DBA tools, commandlets that I can call without having any additional code around them. So I didn't have to define them in functions. I just have them all in this invoke SQL configure function, and then also call the ones that we've defined at the top. And so going through all of that, you can see the standard things that I want for most instances like max DOP, max memory, tempdb config, install Ola Hallingren scripts, install who is active and things like that. So a bunch of different things are happening. And so now each and every instance that I configure will have these settings and those tools installed as well on the instance. So when I go and troubleshoot or I need to make a configuration change and things like that, I know exactly how these things are configured. Then when we call that script, it's gonna go ahead and execute all that code and output the console based on the various command lines that are being used. And then when we're done, we'll have a configured SQL Server instance. So now that we have an installed and configured SQL Server, we wanna run some post-flight checks to make sure that everything we think we did actually got done. And we're gonna write a pester test to do that. And we'll walk through some of the checks here now, so first thing that we'll check is, are all the services started? Is the SQL Server started? Is the SQL Server agent started to make sure that we're actually in the state that we think we are? Next up is, are the required accounts added or disabled to have things like that accounts that we wanna to add to the local administrators group or to the sysadmins fixed server role or disabling SA? I'm also gonna check, are the SPNs configured properly? are any instance settings that we've defined set, things like backup compression or optimizer ad hoc workloads, all that stuff that we configured in invoke SQL configure. Next are any SQL Server agent settings and jobs set. This is a big value to me because it will drive things like backups and index maintenance from the SQL Server agent. And are those jobs defined and configured and scheduled on the instance? And then finally, any database level settings. So we're making, we're making changes to things in the model database uh, and making sure that those are set and any stored procedures that we want. So we install things like who is active and all the Hallingren scripts are those stored procedures on the system. And so these are the types of things that we can check in our post fly checks that are implemented as pester tests. And so we're not gonna walk through the code of a pester test yet here, but I'm gonna show you some output that says, you know, things like, uh, is the SQL Server configuration, or excuse me, is the SQL Server agent configuration correct? You know, testing to see if the SQL Server agent is running. Are there operators defined? Is the SQL Server agent history retention defined in the way that I want it to be? And so we can test all of these configuration parameters with Pester to make sure the things that we think we did actually got done to the instance. And so let's go ahead and look at some Pester tests that we have defined in the code and then also run a Pester test together. All right, so back in VS Code, let's go ahead and kick off our pester test. And so in line 73 here, we have invoke pester, and then specifying the path to the script that we wanna call, which is test-post installation checks.ps1. And so run that code, and it'll go through a series of checks that we've defined in our test. So there we see things like SQL agent configuration, looking for operators, then our database mail config, 
checking to see if our Ola Hallingren scripts are installed and then also are the jobs configured. And so marching through all of the different settings that we've defined in our passer test. Next up in the security configuration, we can see the test and verify the SPN configuration, looking to see if the sysadmin and fixed server role members is appropriate and trace flags and so on. So a bunch of things getting configured inside, or excuse me, getting tested inside this pester test, making sure that we're in the desired state for our system. And so at the bottom here, we can see our tests ran in 13 seconds and 39 tests have passed. So getting lots of functionality out of this script. Now we run this now, we know we're in desired state. We push this system into production. We can come back a week, a month, however far in the future and use this same script to test to see if our system is in the desired state. All right, so here we are at the end of the session and we've covered a whole bunch of things. We looked at how to deploy and manage SQL Server with DBA tools. We talked about some deployment challenges and what's really some of the things that are difficult when we wanna deploy SQL Server and configure it at scale. And then we discussed the benefits of automation and looked at some automation solutions that aren't DBA tools and talked about why I chose DBA tools as a point solution for my customers. We then looked deeply at how to use DBA tools for automated deployments and dove into how to install SQL Server, configure SQL Server, and use Pester for managing our configuration. And so for some resources on this talk, check out all of this information here at dbatools.io is a fantastic place to get the documentation and DBA tools and all of that stuff available to you there. We talked about the GitHub repo, for DBA tools, check that out. There's also a very active Slack community at dbatools.io slash Slack to sign up. And then my friends, Christy Lemaire and Rob Sewell wrote a book on DBA tools published by Manning, DBA tools in a month of lunches. I am a proud owner of that book and cannot impress upon you enough how valuable that is for a DBA that knows that wants to work with DBA tools and PowerShell. So super fantastic stuff. I also wanna call out that I didn't write, I mean, I wrote the code that you saw today, right? And think building the system, but the people that built DBA tools have changed the way that database administration has had and the impact that this group and many of the other contributors that have had with the project are really the ones that have built this solution. I'm just standing on the shoulders of giants here. So Chrissy, thank you. Kirill is the main writer of the install DBA instance commandlet. Rob Sewell, a great friend of mine, DBA with a beard, is a major contributor to project. Jess Ponfret, who's doing a session at PowerShell Summit this year on DSC, is a maintainer of DBA tools now. Thank you for all of your con contributions. Claudio, shout out. Sander and uh, Stuart, thank you so much for all of your work. These are the folks that have built this thing, right? I just wrote some code using the things that they wrote. So uh, fantastic, Im very impactful project in how database administration is done. I'm gonna put my code on my GitHub repo here. Uh, probably by the time you're watching this video, uh, there's my contact information again. Please feel free to reach out if you wanna discuss this solution or if you have any questions about it. Uh, but thank you so much. I hope you enjoy the rest of PowerShell Summit.